This is the Three Diaphragms model, a story about how the mind, body, and spirit are connected, and I share it with every client. You don't need any real drawing skills, and as you'll see, it's pretty easy to map out. So basically, I tell them, well, we start down at the bottom of the pelvis is the sacrum, and on either side are your hip bones. Out of there come your thigh bones, from there your shins, your ankles, and off your ankle, you even have your big toe. So as we can see, there's the lower half of the body. There are five vertebrae in your low back, a dozen vertebrae with ribs in your mid back, two beautiful collarbones, seven vertebrae in your neck, and a 10 pound head. Now, the trick is to take all 206 of these bones, throw them in a bag of jelly, and then see if we can have that structure be both stable and uh, flexible. Now the current myth in Western fitness and rehab is that stability comes from six-pack abs or core strength. Of course, if this was the case, there'd be over six and a half billion people in real trouble in the world. So we're going to look at this as a model of the relationship between three diaphragms, as outlined by research by Hodges and Nasseri and others, Higgins, that uh, has a significant impact on the stability and mobility of the human body. The first diaphragm is the one we're most familiar with, and that's the respiratory diaphragm. That goes across the entire bottom of the rib cage, separating the heart and lungs from the uh, internal organs. When the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down in order to create increased space in the, in the rib cage, which fills then with air, giving a pneumatic stability. But it also <clears throat> increases the intra-abdominal pressure, IAP as they like to call it, which gives an uplift on the spine and the disc below. Now, if that was only this downward pressure, then of course your organs would fall on the floor, so we need a second diaphragm. That diaphragm is called the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor doesn't get much press, but it's a critical structure and the relationship is being more and more defined between how it and these other two diaphragms must operate. So when the, we get that positive pressure down, there's a slight pressure on the pelvic floor and the rhythm or the movement of this is similar to say when you're changing a baby's diaper, how the belly opens and closes, and you've got this nice, even dynamic and rhythm between the two, which keeps both mobile and, and flexible. Now, of course, in life, there are times when we have to get more breath, and when that occurs, we have a backup system, which is up here at the thoracic outlet to include the glottis, the voice box. And this thoracic outlet is a critical backup system where the muscles of the neck and the chest lift up on the rib cage in order to increase the space such as when you've run up the stairs and you put your hands on your knees to, to catch your breath but the problem is when it pulls up it also pulls down so it creates compression in the, the cervical spine now this relationship is so critical because of the high number of times we uh, utilize this movement only uh, the heart beats more and the eyes blink more often, but otherwise patients need to understand that 12 to 15 times a minute they're breathing, which is up to 900 times an hour, which is over 17,000 times a day. So there's a big workload here. Now, how does this all fit together? Well, what we see is that if the person's breathing from the diaphragm, it comes up and it has an effect on the autonomic nervous system. And this, by the same token, uh, if they're breathing from the chest or the thoracic stress breath, it also has an effect on the autonomic nervous system. And so we see that with the chest breath, we're going to get what's known as the sympathetic or the fight or flight breath pattern and if it's the from the diaphragm we'll get the relaxation or the parasympathetic. Now each of these have an important effect on human health and, and movement. 
And so if we go through and list them, we see that as far as pain goes, when you're in the sympathetic, you're going to experience increased pain. When you're in the relaxation, you'll have decreased pain. When you're in a sustained sympathetic, your mood's going to go down. You're going to deplete your mood elevators. When you're in the relaxation phase, you'll elevate those, restore the mood. Your immune system is uh, compromised and sustained sympathetic. There's just not enough energy to, to maintain that. Whereas in the relaxation, it gets energized and revitalized. Your balance goes down under stress, up when relaxed. Your muscle tone decreases in relaxation, increases in fight or flight. Your GI function increases in the rest slash digest phase, decreases in this situation under stress. Your respiratory rate, of course, goes up under stress, comes down under Heart rate, same thing, elevates in stress, decreases, and quality of sleep it goes down under stress, goes up in the rest and relax, and cognition is negatively affected under sustained stress and increased in the relaxation. And so what's interesting to look at here is when these patterns get altered, say someone with back pain, they quit breathing with their diaphragm, and what the, they do is shift the load to their upper chest, which then comes up and fuels the sympathetic transition. When anybody that's treated somebody with chronic back pain recognizes all the rest of these as uh, kind of comorbid conditions that come along with chronic pain. Now, when we get someone to restore their diaphragmatic breath, then we can begin to affect all of these in a positive way. And the way to get to that is to get them to understand how not only is the mind driving the body, but we now understand that if the body is tight, say they have sustained tightness through the upper chest, uh, psoas is tight, they grip through their hips, um, sustained tension in the low back, lumbar paravertebrals, any of those are going to block this rhythm and set up the cycle of uh, perpetual looping between these. And so if we just talk about trying to relax or breathe, that's not sufficient if they have structural limitations. And so any effective therapeutic approach has to look at the dynamics between both structure, the physiology and function, but also understanding that in this relationship, it's not a mind over body type of thing anymore. We understand it better as a mutual peer relationship between the mind and the body. And to that I mean overriding this system in the, in the relatively newer brains is the relationship between the prefrontal cortex, we'll call that our executive mind, and the limbic system. The limbic system containing the amygdala, the um, hippocampus, and <coughs> those structures, the anterior cingulate complex, all of which have to do with our emotional system. So we have the rational and the emotional aspect and we now know that every decision has got a combination of those and so there's this constant dialogue and this dialogue depending on who wins the day comes down and drives the autonomic nervous system which then can fuel this whole host of uh, challenges but it also fuels the dynamic of the relationship whether the person breathes in their chest, their diaphragm or not. If they aren't breathing from their diaphragm, not only do they lose the intra-abdominal pressure here and increase the interdiscal pressure in the neck, but they also um, lose the uh, downward pressure on the pelvic floor. And part of the pelvic floor, through the obturator internus, attaches to the femurs. And so if that pelvic floor 
begins to tighten or lose its flexibility, it limits the power and the stability in the kinetic chain. And then in the kinetic chain, instead of maintaining a nice neutral through the knee and foot down to the big toe, they actually lose stability and begin this pronation or relative internal rotation that can lead to knee issues, SI issues, uh, shin splints, plantar fasciitis, uh, all the way to the bunion. And so we see in yoga they often talk about grounding the big toe and when you ground the big toe of course you're going to get the opposite effect up the kinetic chain, open the pelvic floor, allow the diaphragm to work which offloads the stress load here, increasing the parasympathetic response, easing the dynamics between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. And we know now in most recent uh, literature of pain science that with the practice of becoming uh, aware in the moment or mindfulness that we can actually increase or thicken the connections here to get more stability and that stability then leads to um, the individual having the ability to gain control over this process and not allow themselves to drop into the what we call the vicious cycle, but rather when we teach them how to strengthen, uh, restore flexibility and right relationship or dynamic process is not a static process through their posture, through their uh, thoughts about their job, their relationship with their family members, all those sorts of things. You can begin to feel this in and, and step into the system, mind, body, or spirit, if they have meaningful work, uh, feel unsupported. That's all going to drive these dynamics to set up the loops that will eventually either generate a physical outcome or a physiological outcome. And I find that patients are so relieved to see that, oh, this is why I have to take my uh, antacid, this is why I feel anxious, this is why I can't sleep and have to take my sleep meds and I don't seem to be as clear as I used to be and I keep getting these rashes and colds and gee, now they want me on a mood elevator and I sure do have a lot of pain all the time. And oftentimes this is the first time anyone's explained to them how the, the system can relate. And then from there, of course, it's exciting to be able to take them to a whole new level of uh, awareness and control in their health time to time through the day through this three dynamic diaphragm model.